Well, this episode is going to be a big one. It's two parts. It's a long story, but there's a ton of information in here and a ton of things that we can glean. Um, this guest had a medical condition that really hampered most of her childhood and even young adult life. And hearing the story about how that happened, why that happened, how she overcame that, and then most importantly, seeing and understanding and hearing her positivity is massively valuable. I was so inspired listening to part one of this episode that I let her introduction, her story go on way too long. Maybe not too long, but very, very long. Um, so we've, we've created one episode that you're going to watch right now where we talk about her story and the kind of inspirational values and lessons she brings us about positivity and keep on going essentially. In the second part of this series, we're going to actually talk about her product, which is Oxyware. Oxyware was a product that she designed with no experience, no know-how, no engineering background. And now in 2021, they're going to be launching this as a medical device. She talks about how she uh, found resources to come up with little money to get started, how she started working with advisors and boards of directors, and how she started working with uh, free resources really to help her pull this off. Both parts are incredibly powerful, maybe for different reasons. So I hope that you'll stick out both of these sessions in this series and gain some incredible value from it. Let's get started. Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of the AMPM podcast. Today, we're going to talk about medical stuff, which a lot of times seems super, super complicated to a lot of us that aren't in the medical industry. But for context, we're going to be talking about the development, the implementation, the marketing of a new medical device, which I'm actually uh, kind of excited to talk about. So for our guest today, we have Miss Shavi Fernando coming to us from the great state of Virginia. How are you doing, Shavi? Good. And uh, um, thank you for having me here. Yes, ma'am. So when I started reading the story about this product that you're that you've developed, you've invented, uh, we'll we'll talk about that and how it could be a complete, you know, game changer to the industry. I was very intrigued by it, right? I think that it's uh, it's exceptionally cool, but I'm not necessarily just intrigued by the product. I'm also intrigued by your journey, right? Because you have some sort of obvious medical um, knowledge, you have some sort of tech ability of some sort. But you also have this kind of entrepreneurial bug, which made you decide, hey, not only do I have this cool idea, but I'm going to bring this sucker to the market and it's going to be awesome. So I want to talk about how all of those intersect. Um, but to start off, we have to know a little bit about Shavi. Like, who is Shavi? Where does Shavi come from? Uh, I want like the five minute story of uh, how Shavi ended up today on the AMPM podcast sitting in Arlington, Virginia from Sri Lanka. So give us like the five minute background of you. So I'm originally from Sri Lanka and I have studied uh, computer science. Like I have my undergrad degree in computer science. Then I have a master's in computer science and MBA uh, from both from Australia. So, but I, I'm literally a hippie. You can call me a hippie. That's what I was before. And because I love traveling, I love all, I'm an adrenaline junkie. I love all these, you know, high adrenaline sports. And I used to travel a lot. And so that was literally me. From small days itself, I had breathing issues, but I was diagnosed as asthma. So I have literally tried every inhaler that's available in the market. So, because every time I go to a doctor, they, they just keep changing my inhaler. They didn't bother to do a second diagnosis as to why this was happening. So I have been on inhalers like all my life. And at least every other week I used to go to nebulize in the middle of the night because I couldn't breathe. So because of this, like even though I was a sprinter, my best was 100 meters. I couldn't do 200 because after 100, I start feeling like tired because my heart couldn't take it because I, it was a hole in the heart that I had from small days. So, but the thing was, I didn't get diagnosed for the hole in the heart. I got diagnosed as asthma. Because I know, my and, and was let me pause you for a second. For those of you that aren't watching the YouTube version, like Shavi is so happy. She's smiling, you know, she's like joyful. And I'm like, I want to cry for you. Like poor Shavi, you know, this great, great swimmer can't do the 200 meter because you're out of breath. Like I'm thinking of all of these 
useless puffs of the inhaler that are supposed to help you that aren't helping you. you know, like this plagued your childhood, this misdiagnosis of your medical condition. And, uh, and it's sad. <laughs> it's terrible. So I'm sorry that happened to you. And then after that, I started getting palpitations. Like suddenly, like randomly, it, like my heart rate goes, like just spikes up. And so I had two episodes where I couldn't breathe. And now I know what happened was it was cardiac arrest. But I had I didn't know then. Wait, so I, wait, I, hold I on, my- time out, time out. You just <laughs> said I couldn't breathe. Later found out it was cardiac arrest. Shabby, cardiac it, arrest it is a big deal. Like life. your heart stopped working. Like this is terrible. So I think that's why I'm so good at it now because it's like, you know, you're like, it's just like your common sense now. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do because it has happened so many times. The thing is, every time it happened, once I go to a doctor, all I can say is I couldn't breathe. So hmm. there were so many like diagnoses, like what it was all not relevant. And then in 2015, I went trekking with a friend and then... I was going blue and he was like, you're turning blue. The thing is when your face turns blue, unless someone tells you, you don't know you are blue, right? (laughs) And then I went back home. So with my parents, I said, okay, he says there's something wrong with the heart. And what I was getting, they were not palpitations. They were arrhythmias. So this is what he said. Like, so he said to go to a doctor. And so we took an appointment and went to a cardiologist. He listened to my heartbeat and then he was like, I need to do an echo, but stay in the echo room because I want to do it myself. And so we, I was waiting and he came and he was doing the echo. So I could literally hear, like, like I could see on the echo. It was like, it was like, you know, the Indian traffic, like everything's going everywhere in the heart. <laughs> Like, you know, blue, red, everything's getting mixed. And and he was like this. Like, he was doing the echo like this. Oh, so, so when, you're, when your doctor's doing an echocardiogram and his hand is on his forehead, that's not a good yeah, thing. Yeah, he was like this. He was like this, and he was just like doing the echo. And I could see, like, and I was like, is, so I literally asked him, is there a hole in the heart? Is that what, why it looks like the Indian traffic? And he was like, do you know to read this? I'm like, no, I think it's like common sense when the blood is mixing everywhere. There has to be, you know, a leak, right? (laughs) (laughs) A leak. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And and he was smiling and he was like, okay, get dressed and come to the office. Let's have a chat. And then we went to the office. So he was like, did you have breathing issues when you were small? I said, yeah, like. My mom was like, yeah, every other week we used to go to nebulize. And he was like, didn't anyone say that she has a hole in the heart? And my mom was like, when she was small, the pediatrician said he could hear a murmur. But when we took her to a cardiologist, the cardiologist said, there's nothing like that. Just don't take all these unnecessary things to your head. Just let the kid enjoy her life. So then, like, when I asked him all these questions, so he was like, literally, the Sri Lankan doctor who did the procedure he was like so it's like this it's the condition is very bad and I was like how bad and he didn't say like much he was like well there is no treatment but we you can stay a bit longer with the medicine I was like how long and it was like you will have about maybe two years it was like, okay, so you are telling me I will live just for two years. I was like, look, I have so much in my bucket list that has to be completed. And you can't tell a person that they will live only for two years because not you, not me, no one knows how long a person gets to live. And I told him I will be back in two years and I will say hi to you. And then I told my mom, let's just leave. So then my sister said, okay, I'm going to get an appointment at John Hopkins. So let's get you here. Then I flew to US like the very next week, exactly on my birthday, 2000, October 11th, exactly on the birthday, I flew here. And then I came here and I went to John Hopkins. But because I flew, 
I ended up with a stroke. Wait, what? Oh, <laughs> you just get, like you're saying it like it's a joke, but so you get why you just had a stroke. Yeah, so I ended up in so I was at John Hopkins and they were doing um uh echo and then I ended up with the AI embolism and so literally after the echo, so I asked her, do people feel funny on their face? And she was like, No, they don't. And then like I feel funny on the face. She was like, It must be from the whole thing, procedure, just don't worry. And my sister was seated there, so I took my t-shirt and I put it on my head. That's all I could do. My just hand, my hand just fell off. Like it just fell down. I I literally felt like, you know, a mummy stuck in a, a ghost. <laughs> like, you know, you only can, you, you can see anything, but you can't move your eyeballs even. And that was it. I could see my sister screaming and then I passed out. So when I woke up in the, after the stroke, like I could see the entire director board of Bayview Hospital standing around me, and they were like rubbing my hands and screaming my name. Like, can you hear me? Can you hear me? It was, it was funny. Like how, like you know, all these VIP people standing around you, <laughs> and I was just laughing. And the doctor was like, "Okay, she's smiling. She's laughing. She's good." <laughs> This is this is so bizarre to me. You know, I I worked as a paramedic for uh, ten years, and you know I've seen a lot of medical conditions. I've worked a lot of cardiac arrests. I've worked a lot of strokes. But I can tell you, and I've even I even had some legit saves. You know, where people were clinically dead, and we did CPR and got them back. I can tell you that not a single one of them was ever smiling <laughs> after they regained consciousness. So I'm pretty sure that these doctors thought you had just gone completely crazy by this point. <laughs> And, they were, and then after that, they were like, uh, can you hear me? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. And then they were like, uh, can you, like, they asked me to press the hand, but I didn't have, like, my left side didn't have that full strength. So then they asked me to, they, they were, like, moving me to the John Hawkins baby ER. And then when I went there, like, everyone was, like, asking questions. I was, like, answering them and smiling, and they were like, you know, you're the first patient who came to ER smiling. So I ended up in the John Hopkins ICU for three weeks. Before they discharged me, I had to do a walk test and I couldn't walk. I was athlete, but I couldn't walk 500 feet. I was turning blue. So I was put on continuous oxygen. And then they said that the rate this is going, let's see, we'll put you on vasodilators, but we have to see how it reacts. Otherwise, be prepared for a, both lungs and a heart transplant between, between two years. And what happened was because they did that invasive test, my whole body got disturbed because my body had come up with its own system to support my lifestyle. But when they went and did an invasive test, it got completely disturbed. And that's why like, I knew my, I, it's like, you know, when you get used to a new environment, when you move from one country to another country, you need to get adjusted to the new environment. So it's like that my, even my love, I know they are capable. It's just they need time to get back to their normal routine. So what I did was in the passage in the apartments, I started walking every day, like trying to get my lungs and hearts to like function again, the normal way. And then when I went for my six month test, I actually walked 900 feet. And then in six minutes, and then after first, the first year I walked, after six months, I walked 1,700 feet. And now I walk 1,900 feet for six minutes. So I kept like doing everything and I kept increasing my, like kept, like the lung and heart function. And so I didn't want to, so then after that, I went and bought a portable uh, oxygen concentrator. And then I was like, okay, I used to be a workaholic and I was not ready to sit at home and just, you know, be trapped because of this. I was like, okay, I need to get out and do like start living my life again. Maybe I can't fight Sri Lanka, but I can restart here. So then what I did was the best. See, even though you are qualified in US, it's hard to find a job. Yes. It, so then the only option I had was, okay, let's study again. So then I got 
I applied to Georgetown and I got admission to do masters at Georgetown. So what I did was I started a third master's degree <laughs> because that was the only option to get my life back. And then I started studying. Then, in, so because I was a workaholic and see my expertise is in project management, so website software development. So I worked four jobs. I worked for the Office of Deans. I worked for the Makerspace and I worked for four departments on their web development and marketing advertising material designing. And then in the evenings, I worked at the Makerspace because I loved all making stuff and doing stuff as the operations coordinator. So in summer, when I was working, like suddenly, like I was working for this uh, School of Foreign Service program, uh, which works with the US government uh, for the summer internship. So as a programs officer, and then I got a call. So, now I was not on oxygen at all times. I only wore it when I need it. And then I went to answer a call because my director was not there. And then when I was coming back, I literally felt like I couldn't breathe, like how it was before. Like I felt like my heart was not going and then I couldn't breathe at all. And then my friend walked in and she was like, your whole face is blue. And then I figured like I couldn't breathe. So first thing I did was I quickly went. Luckily, I carry my oxygen everywhere, even though I don't need it. I put my oxygen on, crank it up to four liters. And I knew the drill because it has happened before. At that time only I realized, so okay, all this time they were cardiac arrest, not asthma attacks. So I hit my chest, jumped on the same spot. And my friend was like, what am I supposed to do? I was like, just call 911. But then after that whole thing happened, the doctors at John Hopkins and everyone was like, you can't live alone because at that time I was living alone. I moved into my own apartment and I was doing everything on my own and I was living alone and just literally I started my life back. And then they were like, uh, you should think about changing the school because Georgetown is the most hilly school in the area. You should find a school which doesn't have much hills. I was like, no way, I'm not changing Georgetown. I love that school. And so a lot of like, they were literally questioning my independence and they were asking me to go back to where I was when I moved to US and I was not prepared for it. So I bought like all the wrist wearables, everything. And I was like, okay, I have a quick bit. I have this, they will warn me. Then the doctor was like, no, your problem is your blood oxygen. It drops down so drastically. He was like, you are literally like a person living in Tibet. You can function with about 50% oxygen without a problem. Yeah. You don't feel it. You're physically, you're fine. But the thing is, at that time, sometimes it comes back, but sometimes it doesn't come back. And you have no warning until it, you end up with a stroke or you end up with a cardiac arrest. All right. So, so let that's me time the problem out. here. Let me time out and recap yeah. for a second. So you were trying to live independently, but you are obviously having some pretty serious health problems. I mean, you're having strokes. You're having you know, your heart stopping because your blood oxygen level is dropping so low that your organs would just cease to function. Right. Um, yeah. I, and what the doctors were telling you was that you needed to monitor this. So you're talking about Fitbits, you know, like Fitbits will monitor yeah. heart rate, but they don't actually monitor your oxygen stat. You know, they're not monitoring perfusion yeah. and things like that. And for you, the problem wasn't your heart rate or your blood pressure necessarily. It was your, your, oxygen levels in your blood were too low. And for those of you that like don't understand the very simple version of how your heart works, and this is very applicable, is your heart um, receives blood from the rest of your body that the oxygen has been removed. And then it pumps it through your lungs where your blood is reoxygenated. And then your heart pumps it back out into the rest of your body. But when you have, like Shavi was saying, you know, like the roads in India, like nobody's staying in their lanes, everything's mixed up. So the oxygenated blood from your lungs is getting mixed back in with the deoxygenated blood that's coming from the rest of your body. And that highly oxygenated blood is not being delivered efficiently. Did I say all that right, Shavi? I think I did. Yeah. So, so essentially, there was nothing on the market that would help you monitor your blood or your oxygen level correctly. Now, like when I was a paramedic, we had those little things that clipped on it in your fingers. Now they're bulky. Yeah. They suck. You can't walk around with those stupid things. And honestly, they're not very I accurate. Have about eight of them. 
Yeah, and they're yeah, they're not very accurate. Every place in the house. Yeah. Yeah, and, and in a different scenarios, you lift your arm up, you lift it down, your hand gets cold. Uh, you're positionally like you can sit with your arm in a funny position, like on the armrest of an airplane seat, and it will drop, but the rest of your the core of your body is fine. So there was a problem. So let me let me pause for a second, Shavi, and we're gonna talk about we're gonna have to do something I've never done before. Normally, when I ask people's like origin story of what they get into, we take five minutes. But your story is so interesting. Like you've died multiple times, Shavi, and you're laughing about it, which I think is amazing. Like I love your um your positive spirit. I don't want to minimize your story because the background story is amazing, but we don't have time to keep going in this episode. So what I'd like to do, if that's all right, is I would like to go ahead and and close out this episode and I'd like to get with you and schedule a follow-up episode. And the episode, the next episode, so we'll have like a part one and part two with Shavi, right? Is I want to talk about Oxyware, which is the company that you've started. And you're obviously a smart cookie, right? So you took all this, um, this cap- these capabilities that you got, you know, 72 master's degrees on. And what I think the story is going to evolve to is that you have a condition that other people have similar conditions that have other similar needs. You couldn't find a solution to monitor your blood oxygen level while maintaining an active lifestyle, right? You needed something. So I'm going to fast forward and say that the, uh, the, the end of the story is that you designed and basically uh, invented a new medical device that would do that, right? And you, you did that based on this need that you have. So, in the next episode, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about Oxyware. I'd like to talk about how you invented it. I'd like to talk about the marketing process. I'd like to about, talk about how you're launching this, how you're getting approval. Like that's a whole nother episode that I want to talk about. But I have to ask you this, like as we wrap up this episode, look, you've had some crap going on in your life, right? Even stuff you haven't talked about, just moving around, just being told, hey, you've got a hole in your heart. You got two, you know, two years left to live. Well, fine, I'll go to the US and you move over and, you know, you're spending three weeks and, you know, John, I mean, like, there's so much that you didn't talk about, but like, I'm picking up on it. And it's stuff that other people, well, that all of us, that humans would find very, very discouraging, right? Like, extremely discouraging and you have been slapped down and beat down a lot of times you've been told you can't do it um but you just keep getting up and doing it. you keep moving and what i'm most impressed about honestly is just this positive attitude like as we wrap up this episode i have to ask you this and this can be very general but you've had all this crap that's happened to you and you've been told no all your life you've always had these restrictions you've always been told you can't do this you shouldn't do this we won't let you do this how do you take that and not only turn it into something valuable, you know, like a, like a business opportunity, something you can do to help others, but how do you stay so freaking positive? Well, see, my whole life, I think it's because one thing is, um, so I'm Buddhist, right? So something that we were taught when we were small is, it's an exercise that we've got in school. So a Buddhist teacher, so even though I'm Buddhist, I studied in a Catholic school, right? But in Sri Lanka, even though you study in a Catholic school, you are taught Buddhism for all the Buddhist kids. So one thing that we were taught when we were small is to think that you are sick continuously. Okay, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick. And then you actually fall sick. Right? Because your body works based on your thought process. Yes. Right. To an extent. The way you think... Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, like, your 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 mental habits can affect you physiologically. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, like because if you're if you're thinking all negatively, so you are literally like a magnet, right? That's how I think. You're like a magnet, right? So if you're negative, you attract all the negative vibes. But if you're positive, you attract all the positive vibes, right? And they say like, you know, your your vibe attracts your tribe right so it's similarly like that so for me my whole life i've been a person if things have happened in life there's no point of worrying it you can't turn change them back like what's the point of all worrying about the things that has already happened if there's a time machine where you can go back and change them okay fine and if worrying is going to fix them fine but otherwise what's the point in worrying them worrying about those because something I always tell you, don't burn your blood over things that you have no control of. Because every time you worry, you burn another pint of blood in your body. <laughs> right? 
So I've always, I've never taken things in life seriously. So I'm someone who lives for the day and plan for tomorrow. If things went wrong, okay, fine. It went wrong, but no point of crying over it. Just move on. Live your life. Something I think is if things didn't go the way you wanted, that's not because, you know, that it was not meant to happen because something better is on the way. That's how I look at it. Right? And it's a good example. Like, see, if I didn't get diagnosed with this, I wouldn't have made Doxyware. Right? So things in life always happen for a reason. And the other thing is, none of us knows when we will die. Right? I might die tomorrow, maybe by falling off this chair. Not from my disease. Just don't right? do it on camera. If you're going to die by falling out of your chair, let's turn the recording off first because that would make the whole episode. Because we still got to do a second episode, Shava. You can't die before yeah. we do a second yeah. episode. My, my, my life is dramatic enough. I don't think I need that episode. <laughs> <laughs> dying with a, dying falling off a chair. Dying on a webcam, yep. Yeah. Amazing. And so... So that's why it's no point of like you worrying about what might happen tomorrow because you, no one has control of it. We don't know when our return ticket is, so you might as well just live, enjoy life while you got it. Why worry about things you have no control of? Amen. Because the more you worry, Amen. you get old, you get wrinkles, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Can't have wrinkles. That's it. Man, this is... Why you want gray and wrinkles? Yep. So uh, I, I can't tell you how thankful I am for you to share your story. I know you've shared your story with other people and, and I know you've talked about this a lot, but um, I'm certain that those that are listening to this episode are grateful for your positivity and your optimism and, and, you know, tying that all into some life lessons at the end is so important. You know, I, I love what you said about, I even wrote it down here, you know, negative attracts negativity and positive attracts positivity. So, you know, yeah. I, you being positive is, is, is helping you, you know, in a lot of ways, but also I love this, you know, you don't know, we don't know when we're going to die. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. All right. We have to wrap up this episode. Those of you that are listening, prepare for episode two. Uh, as soon as we're done recording, I'll, I'll figure out the schedule, Shavi, and we can, we can sit down and do that. But in episode two, we're going to talk about the, the brainchild that came from all of this adversity oxywear but again thank you for sharing your story and thank you for sharing your outlook on life and i mean these last like 10 minutes have just been full of knowledge bombs that are applicable to everything whether it's our health whether it's our business whether it's our family you know everything so thank you for sharing that with us those of you that are uh, are listening if you found any value in this episode make sure to leave us a positive review on whatever podcast platform you're li you're listening on give us a thumbs up on the uh, video if you're watching this on youtube and we're going to sign off momentarily and we will see you guys on episode two uh, the follow-up episode with Miss Shavi Fernando from Oxywear. Thank you guys for listening. We'll see you on the next one.